顿大学的博士，对，第第几年？第几层嘛？我还是博士，博士生。他做的研究就是那个跟中古时期的那个中国佛教的占星学有关，包括印度的占星学，还有那个啊啊，来看这个。印度的占星学，还有甚至啊、呃，有关于这个、呃、希腊的占星学对中国宗教的影响啊、哦，那里面有很多不只是这个啊、呃，就是中国佛教的材料，它从很早的这个中国佛教的，尤其是大正藏排秀里面的一些资料爬书出来，很早时期的这个佛教就有。很多的跟占星有关的这种思想在里面，那尤其跟我们这门课最有关系，就是后期的这个密教，在中国的这个密教这个这个部分，跟开始跟道教有一些占星上面的这种观点，包括我们这门课以前有读过很多跟移斗或者是跟这个祭星这种法啊仪式有关，所以呃。对于啊、呃，尤其道教学者来讲，我们非常想理解这个在佛教，尤其他从印度来的这个脉络里面的这个占星，啊、呃，的这个部分对于中国以后的这个影响啊，尤其对今天的台湾来讲，很多仪式都跟心有关，跟你们本命有关。像梅子就在做这这方面的研究，我们很多同学，包括醒圣兄也在，也是做这方面的台湾命教的专家啊，所以。呃，我们今天非常高兴，刚好这个 Jeffrey 他来到台湾，而且很快就要回日本，所以我们<笑>很高兴能够邀请到他来讲这个题目。这个题目真的很少人，很少人这方面领域的专家，而且我自己非常重视这个领域，所以我们今天就很欢迎 Jeffrey 来，来我们热烈掌声。我们接下来时间就给 Jeffrey。Okay, uh, thank you very much for that introduction. And、uh, so today,、um, as As I said, I will be talking about Buddhist astrology in、um, China. So please follow along with the slides, and、uh, we'll get started. So the first question to ask is, what is astrology? Now, in the late 14th century,、um, there was the word, you know, astrologia, which is Latin, you know, astronomy, the science of the heavenly bodies, and this comes from a Greek word. And originally, there was no difference between the word astronomy and astrology, but from around、um, you know the 15th century or so、um, in the Renaissance, there was a distinction made between astrology and astronomy. And so today, in European languages, astronomy refers to the science or observation of the stars,、um, and astrology refers to horoscopes. And astral divination, th this sort of、um, thing. So we have to make that distinction now. But historically, in China, in Europe,、uh, in even、um, you know Islamic countries as well, there actually was no strong dif difference between what's astrology and astronomy. But when we're speaking about the subject now, we have to be very clear what we're talking about. Um, and then I have to talk. I have to mention this that we're talking about Occidental astrology. Occidental means Western, and I use the term Occidental because、um, if you say Western, you sort of think European. Whereas what I mean is basically West of China,、mm -hmm. because China had its own form of astrology, which、uh, developed, I guess, in the Warring States period. So around the fifth century BCE,、um, you know, we have Fen Fen Ye. So You know, dividing the sky into different places,、um, and that's very, that's completely independent of what developed in、uh, west of China. And the origin of Occidental astrology is Babylon. So if we look here,、um, we can see the two green lines, and that's、uh, emerging from Babylon, Mesopotamia, the cradle of civilization, and. Both the Indian and Greek forms of astrology are largely rooted in Babylon, so there was a transmission of astrology to Greece, and there was also a, a transmission of it to India. And so, if we go back to ancient history, around 1000 BCE, we have the Enuma Anu Enlil. So it was running to 70 tablets, contained 
7,000 omens accumulated from past experience and provides relevant advice regarding the signals from the gods. And so Mesopotamia recognized the periodicity of various celestial phenomena while devising prediction methods. So in other words, the Babylonians were obser observing the skies, and they also had a religious belief that the gods would send messages um, to people, to, to people on earth, and uh, it was up to the people to discern these messages, and it was especially important for the leadership, the kings, to understand this. And so this is the origin of both Indian and Greek astrology is largely rooted in this tradition. And so from about 700 to 500 BCE, um, there's the Babylonian star list, the Mul Apin series, which records the 12 zodiacal constellations among the 18 star groups in the path of the moon. And this is also when we have the invention of the 12 zodiacs. Um, in classical Chinese, the Shiargong, an amalgamation of earlier models of 18 signs. So, you know, we can see here the um, 12 zodiacs. We're all familiar with this. And so again, this emerged in uh, Babylonia, in Mesopotamia, in the Near East. Now, in order to understand how this got transmitted to India, we have to look at um, some other historical developments. In a, around 513 BCE, Darius the Great conquered the Indus Valley. And if we look at the map here, we can see um, the Indus Valley. So this is the western border of India and the eastern frontier of the Persian Empire. And so the Persians had also conquered Babylonia by this time and also had accumulated some of this knowledge. So there was a bridge, a way to transmit this um, practice, this art, this knowledge um, into India. And this was just one of the first developments. And so by 400 BCE, the astronomy of the Jyotir Vedanga um, was greatly influenced by ideas introduced from Mesopotamia into India, probably through Iranian intermediaries. Um, this this I, I got from um, Pingri, David Pingri, who was, I guess, uh, he died several years ago, but he was um, the leading expert and foremost authority on the history of Indian astrology. And he also wrote a very thick book on Babylonian astronomy. And so he discerned uh, Mesopotamian ideas in this one early period Indian text, the Jyotir Vedanga. And so we can already see that the transmission had occurred by that year. But also, the, the astronomy and astrology was transmitted west to Greece. So around uh, 350 to 250 BCE, the Babylonian Berossus, who was born around 350 BCE, um, settled on the island of Kos and taught astrology. So such Babylonians are thought to be responsible for introducing astrology into Greece. So we can see here in the Eastern Mediterranean um, how, you know, there's, there's, there, it was easily uh, transversed by sea and by land. So, you know, the uh, Babylonians also settled in the eastern frontiers of the Greek heartland. And uh, moving on. Then we also have Alexander the Great, and so he died in 323, and we can see his, how expansive his empire was. And so this also uh, allowed for Greek knowledge to spread eastwards. And as we all know, there were Greeks who settled in what's now um, northwestern India, in um, Afghanistan, in what's now Pakistan. And so there were Greek colonies. And so as a result of this, there was a lot of knowledge being exchanged between everywhere between Greece and India and uh, the Persian heartlands as well. But another interesting develop, hap, de development happened. So in the 2nd century BCE, the Hellenistic astrology thrives in the Ptolemaic Kingdom of Egypt, which was founded after Alexander's death. So we will remember that it was um, after Alexander that his generals um, formed a number of king kingdoms. One of them was the Ptolemaic Kingdom in Egypt. There was also the Seleucids and so on. And so in Egypt, they had, uh, you know, they had, there, was, there was Egyptian astrology, but then there was also a lot of Greeks who settled in Alexandria. So Alexandria was a trading port that had a lot of connections um, to, with the Mediterranean, but also going as far east as India. So there was a lot of, it was basically a cosmopolitan city. 
And so this is where we see the emergence of horoscopes predicting the future of individuals. This is the birth of Western astrology, um, which became popular in the Roman Empire from the first century BCE. So around the first century BCE, this is also when we start seeing astrology um, as an independent field in Roman history. Um, before that, the Romans had their own forms of divination. They had um, such things as you know, augury and so forth, or you know, inspecting the insides of animals, looking for uh, messages from the gods. And so it became popular in Rome, and there was also a lot of trading connections between the Roman Empire and uh, India as well in the following centuries. So from 100 to about 500 CE, Greek astrology and astro astronomy are transmitted to India. Uh, exactly how this happened is still unclear, but it was in multiple factors. There were um, Greeks and Romans living in Western India, and there was also the Greek colonies in the Northwest. Um, Greek astronomy was also quite advanced, and this is why it influenced the uh, Indian uh, uh, field of astronomy as well. So just to summarize this point, India received Babylonian astrology from around the 5th century BCE, which they developed in their own way. Uh, the Greeks also received Babylonian astrology from the 4th century BCE. They developed this, and from the 2nd century CE, this knowledge was spread to India. So this is how Occidental astrology ended up in India. So the first transmission was Babylonian, probably through Persia, and the second major transmission was from Greek sources. And so the Indians also developed their own native models and ideas and concepts of astrology, and uh, this started influencing um, the Buddhist tradition as well. But how did the Buddha feel about astrology? Because the Buddha, assuming he died around the 5th century BCE, he uh, would have, uh, he might not have actually seen the introduction of this, but later Buddhists did. So, uh, as we can see here, the Buddha in this uh, Sutra of the Buddha's instruction on the Brahman Ambata, in, which was translated by Zhe Qian between 223 and 253, um, he says, a shamana must not observe the sky, make calendrical calculations, nor calculate the sun and moon. Nothing is known of boxing and waning eclipses, meteorites, strange occurrences, landslides, earthquakes, and annual winds and rains. So, we can see here from just this quote that in very early Buddhist literature, it's saying that the shaman, the shamana, the Buddhist monk, is not to practice astrology, astronomy, he's not to know anything about calendars. So. And this is common knowledge, even today. I mean, Chinese monks and nuns, everybody knows you're not supposed to do astrology. But, and we also have the, the Vinaya, so the Slifundu, which is what the Chinese monks and nuns today uh, follow. And again, it says here, uh, you're not supposed to you know, talk about uh, you know, astrologically significant days. It must not be said, today there are good constellations like this. And again, this is common knowledge. And this is also the same in all of the Vinaya texts. So the Mahasamgika Vinaya, the Mula Sarvasta Vinaya, all traditions of the Vinaya say you're not supposed to do astrology if you're a monk or nun. And then we also have a sutra which forbids this as well. And this is actually saying this in very strong language. It's saying, you know, if you do practice astrology, then Shifei Shaman, you're not a real Shramana. And it's also saying this in very critical language, because it's saying that if you do practice astrology as a bhikshu, you will destroy your practice as a shramana. It will hinder meditation and study. And so it says, you're having contemplated fortune in life, he is unaware of the losses. Why renounce the home life? So again, it's saying this in very strong language. And so the early Buddhist tradition was against astrology. And then this, we can also be sure that this text um, because it was translated in the 6th century. This was composed, this was written down at a time when astrology was being rapidly introduced and developed uh, into India. So the, the early Buddhist tradition was opposed to astrology. And then it also tried to refute it. So uh, again here it's, it's talking about how astrology is logically 
wrong, how it's, it's, it's um, unreasonable. Um, you know, as to that star, its power is not constantly fixed, as it is also hindered and has superior and inferior capacities. This star is further covered by a superior star. That star at a different time is further covered by a different star. Thus, it should be understood that astrology is untainable, a yoga. And so there's, there's several examples of this in this sutra. Um, this Changpa Yin Shuji. There are several examples where astrology is refuted. It's demonstrated to be wrong. It's demonstrated to be illogical. So the Vinaya says, as a monk or a nun, you're not supposed to practice astrology. And we have a major sutra that says astrology is wrong, and it's unreasonable, and it's impossible. And then this sort of knowledge was also in early Buddhist uh, scriptures in China, so Fo Yi Jiao Jing. And as we know, this sutra um, might have actually been written in China, or at least the version we have it, it would, might have been composed in China. And again, it's saying here, all these different things you're not supposed to do. You're not supposed to cut down trees, dig in the earth, mix medicines, divine fortunes, and this Yang Guang Shi Xiao. So again, this is talking about astrology and um, calendars, uh, you know, astronomy. So again, this is not something that a Dikshu is supposed to do. Now, one of the first Buddhist sutras which were introduced into um, China was the Sharlu Lakarna Vadana. And so, the, the first translation of this, according to Gao Xuan Sutra Catalog, the Dat Han Mei Ian Lu, was translated into Chinese by An Shi Gao in around uh, 151. Um, this text doesn't exist anymore, mm -hmm. but uh, so it, it was nevertheless uh, the first text. And we, we know that we know the contents of this because there's the Sanskrit, the Tibetan, and there's also a later Chinese translation, which is the Modam Jia Ji, which was translated by Jurchen around 2:30. Um, now. Whether this was really translated in 230 or not is still unclear. Um, John Natchir, who is an American scholar, doesn't do, um, think that this was translated by Churchyam, but most Japanese and Chinese scholars that I've read um, don't doubt this. And uh, in any case, though, uh, this is expressly talking about astrology. If you just look at this quote here, um, it says here, someone born on the day when the moon, moon passes through Kirtika will have a great name and be respected by people. Those born when the moon passes through Rohini will have status and wealth, being praised by the masses. Uh, so Kritika and Rohini, these are um, the Arshupa Shil, the 28 Shil. Uh, although, we have to just kind of look at this quickly. A Nakashetra, a Shil, is one of the 28 lunar stations along the ecliptic. So, okay, if, if we look at this illustration, if you look south, this white band, and then there's the red lines here, uh, is where the sun passes over. And so it's, it's the band of sky that the sun um, passes over the course of a year. And also the moon travels along that, and then every night it's in a different place in the sky. And so it will be in 28, about 28 different places before it returns to its original place. So if you divide this into 28 sections, then you get the 28 Nakashetra, the Arshirba Shil. Now, this is interesting because the, in ancient China, uh, around 500, around the 5th century BCE, so around the time of Kongzi, the Confucius, the Chinese had already developed the Arshirba Shil, the 28 uh, lunar stations. But, in India as well, they also had the idea of the 28 Nakashetras. So some people have suggested that these two traditions emerged from the same place, or the Chinese invented it and transmitted it to um, India, or the Indians invented it and transmitted it to China. And so there's been this debate for at least 100 years about this. And so the leading authorities that I've looked at, Yan Lomichio and um, uh, Pankinier, David Pankinier, they both say that no, they developed independently. The earliest reference to the 28 Nakashetras in Indian literature is the Atharva Veda. So it's one of the Vedas in, in, in the Hindu canon, which is maybe about 1000 BCE. 
And then the first reference we see to this in Chinese is around the 5th century BCE. Uh, and my personal opinion is that they developed independently. Because if you look at the moon over the course of several years, you'll see that more or less it takes 27 or 28 days for it to go around the ecliptic. So it, it, it's just a logical development. And there's no evidence that this was ever in Babylon because the Babylonians developed the 12 zodiacs. So they divided the ecliptic into 12 places. And that's more based on the sun rather than uh, the moon. So again, so we have this long list here. And these, these different um, parts of the ecliptic are not identical. So the Chinese system is different from the um, Indian system. And the Indian system changed over the centuries. So as um, David Pingree has pointed out in one of his papers, it was never really consistent. So you know which stars corresponded to which nakashetra was never um, always consistent. And so even the Chinese recognize this, because in some of the texts, the Chinese say that the Indian stars don't correspond to the Chinese stars. But nevertheless, because there were 28, they could actually just use the, the Chinese terms when translating the Sanskrit. And so then the first text to introduce the 12 zodiacs was the, um, well, it was it's a collection of sutras in, under one name. Um, and then so this one section here, the Erzang Fan Zhong Xin Xiao Pi, is the first Chinese text um, that we know of that mentions the 12 zodiacs. So if we look at this list here, we can see you know, uh, the different literal names translated from the Sanskrit. So um, I've provided both the Sanskrit and the uh, English, as well as the, the Chinese terms as they appear in this uh, section of the sutra. Uh, however, at this time, this was not influential. Um, it, it appears in the sutra, but it doesn't seem like it was influential. And so the earlier, the Odang Jia Jing, the Matangi Sutra, had been translated as well, but it doesn't seem that anybody was really practicing this in China yet. There, there wasn't really much of an interest in Indian astrology yet. And then if we go to the early Tang Dynasty, uh, Manichaeanism, Mongi Zhao, was formally introduced into China. Now the Manichaeans uh, practiced the seven day week and so with uh, its associated astrological elements, some of which were incorporated into Chinese Buddhist literature. So, I mean, if you study Japanese, you know that there's Oyobi, you know, Nichiyobi, Getsuyobi, so on and so on. And uh, so this is the seven-day week. And the seven-day week uh, basically originates from uh, Greece. Mm -hmm. And it was introduced in India around maybe the 4th century CE. Um, I'll, we'll cut off here a bit. But in any case, this the, the ordering is based on a union of Egyptian beliefs and deities overseeing each of the 24 hours and the Greek cosmological concept of concentric spheres. The spheres run in the descending order of Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, the Sun, Venus, Mercury, and the Moon. So the first hour of the first day is assigned to Saturn. Uh, the second hour is assigned to Jupiter, the third to Mars, and so on. So when you get to the 25th hour, it's the Sun. And then the 49th hour is assigned to the Moon. So. And so from that, what you basically get is, so the first hour is Saturn, and then the 25th hour. So the 25th hour will be um, the Sun, and then the 49th. So the first day starts on Saturday, the second one would be a Sunday, and then the following day would be a Monday. So this is actually the origin of the seven day week, the ordering of, as we have it now. It's actually the same in English as well, it's just that the, the names have changed over the centuries. But you can still see it Saturday, Saturn, right? Monday, Monday, Sunday, Sunday, right? So, it, it, but, and then this is, this is also clear when you look at like the Greek and the Latin. It's just that the English has changed over time. And so the next figure we get to in the history of astrology and astronomy, uh, or Western or Occidental astrology in China is Yixing. So he assisted Shubhakara Simha in translating the Bhattarjing, the Mahavarochana Sutra. And then Yixing also composed his commentary, the Bhattarjing uh, Shu. And then he's famous for compiling the Kaiyuan uh, Da'yin the, Yin, which was completed in 727. So he was an expert in um, astronomy and calendars. 
And then he also, in his youth, extensively studied Chinese sciences as well as Taoist texts under um, a Taoist adept. His uh, name was Yu Chong. And then later on, if you look at the Taisho canon, there's several texts which are attributed to him, including the Shou Yao Di Gui, the Qiao Xin Chan Bie Xin Fa, the Bei Dou Xi Xin Hong Mo Fa, and the Ban Tian Bu Luo Zhou Yao. But these are not his works. And they were composed in the 9th century. If you look at these texts, and we're going to look at some of them later on, uh, they have elements in them that mean that they cannot have been written by him. And we'll look at that later. But the next person I want to look at is the Moghavadra, Bukong. So Bukong, or Moghavadra, was born in Samarkand. His father was Indian, and his mother was Sogdian. So he wasn't native Chinese, but at the age of 10 he was in China, and so in 719 he was ordained by Vajra Bodhi and became his disciple. Um, he was a prolific translator, he was also actively engaged in politics, and he was the teacher of uh, Hui Guo, who was the teacher of Kukai. And we all know Kukai as the founder of Shingon in Japan. Now the text he translated, or compiled rather, was the Xiu Yao Jing, and this is basically the main text of Tang Dynasty Buddhist astrology. And so it was an astrological manual compiled by him. And the initial draft was done in 759. And so this is from the heading of the text. It says here, the master translated this work in year two of rain era, Qinyan, which was 759. So uh, Su Yao of uh, Guangzhou penned it and collated it. He could not manage it well, making the meaning of the content abstruse. There was a concern that scholars would find it difficult to implement. So basically, they they compiled this version. It's, it's, it's called a translation, but it's not a translation. There's no version of this text in Tibetan or, in, or, or any Indian literature. There's no Sanskrit version of it. And if you look at the text, it seems to basically be a very basic introduction to Indian astrology. It's a very basic introduction. Um, and it seems to have been compiled by multiple sources, like from multiple sources. Uh, it's not like one coherent text that was translated from an Indian source. Probably Amoga Vajra had multiple Sanskrit manuscripts available to him and either somebody requested him or he thought he would compile this astrology manual. So introduce, introducing Indian astrology as he understood it to China. And then the, the first version of the text was very difficult to understand. So consequently, the commoner disciple Yang Jingfang personally revised a new draft according to direct instructions, after which it was carefully copied. Every disciple each carried off one scroll. The time was then spring of year two and rain era, Fong De, 764 of the Great Tang. Now there are two extant versions of this sutra. The first version of Sri Al first and the second revised edition by Yang Jingfang. So, uh, this 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 text has um, two scrolls. There's the, the it's called the you know Shangjuan uh, and the Xiaojuan, and then the bottom one, the, the Xiaojuan, is the old version, and then the Shangjuan is the uh, new version. Now, uh, and so the the, the text also um, helps to introduce the Indian model into Chinese. And so it's very clear that there's a very strong, there's a big difference between how the Chinese understand the calendar and how the Indians understand the calendar. So in the Great Time, the year commences from the first lunar month, while in India, the year will begin from the second lunar month. So while the Great Time names the months as first, second, third, fourth, so yi yue, ar yue, san yue, up to the twelfth, in India, the month is always named based on the constellation the moon is in on the night of the 15th day of the Shukla Paksha. Hence, the second lunar month is the month of Chitra, and the third lunar month is the month of Vishaka. So I have an illustration here. Here's it here. Yeah, so this is a table that I've translated from the text, the sutra. If you translate it back into Sanskrit, it looks like this. Um, that's cut off here, but basically on the far right there, you see um, the first month. So that would correspond to Yi Yue on the Chinese calendar. But the, the, the thing is, though, is that the Indian calendar 
starts on R U. What the Chinese call R U. So you have to use this table if you want to understand um, how the system works um, in the Indian model. But on the other hand, too, if you follow this table, you just have to know what day um, of the lunar calendar you were born, and then you can see which Nakashetra or Arshipa Shil you belong to on here. So it basically, the text is, is making it very easy to um, incorporate or understand the Indian system. And as a result of this, um, in the text, the, the original text, um, the handwritten manuscript of the text, um, which is actually preserved in Japan. I should actually say this, that this text, the Xiu Yao Ji, there is the version in the Taisho, the, the uh, tai, tai Zheng, but the problem with this text is that the contents are very different from the Japanese manuscript. The Jap this is the, what, what you see here is the Japanese manuscript, I think, I think it's from the 13th century. And the Japanese version of the text is different from the one that was printed in China. And the Japanese version of the text is probably the original version of the text, um, if you look at the differences between them. And so this table was included in the original text. Um, you can't really see the details of this too well, but basically it's a, it's a way for uh, you to understand the model of the text. And then if you translate it um, into English, it looks like this. So again, uh, you know, the different uh, places in the sky and where it corresponds to on the calendar. Um, so basically, my point is that Amoka Bhadra, he provided these tables so that Chinese readers could easily understand the Indian model and convert. You could convert back and forth very easily. Because the Chinese, even though they were aware of the Indian model, they, they continued using a lunar calendar. Uh, their own lunar calendar. The, the Indian calendar is also a lunar calendar. And, um, but nevertheless, if you want to practice Bi Jiao, you have to know the Indian calendar. Especially because th there's significant days of the year you have to observe. Or if you want to do a, a, a puja, if you want to do a ritual, you can coordinate it with the calendar. So, um, as a result of this, you know, n now we start seeing in the Tang Dynasty a very strong interest in astrology. Um, and so this is an example of uh, one of the horoscopes here. I can't really see it so well, but if you, if you just look at some, some of what it's saying here, it's saying here, it, so if you were born on um, Ashlesha, um, its shape is like a snake's head. Um, the food, because there's, there's food associated with each shio or nakashetra. In this one, it's the flesh of a large serpent. I assume that means you're supposed to eat snake on this day. So we can have shu tang on this day, if you want. But then it also says here, uh, you know, when there is a convergence with this constellation, one should be bold and decisive, attacking the refractory and removing evil, lay siege to cities, destroy and swallow all under heaven. And then it also says here, um, you know, it, it's talking about what a person born under this constellation will be like. So it says, those persons born during a convergence with this constellation are inclined towards a sleepy disposition and a defiant spirit while being dispossessed towards anger. They will not be deceived by people. They also enjoy charity as well as enjoy pillaging. They will be addicted to romantic affections. Now, the one thing to, to keep in mind here, though, is it's talking about two things that are very noteworthy here. Eating meat. And this is a Buddhist text. As we know, in, in most Chinese Buddhist texts um, would object to eating meat because the, the Han Wang Jing says, you know, the Bodhisattva, Pusa, Pukwe Chiro, we don't eat meat if we're a Bodhisattva. But here it's talking about eating a snake. And this is coming from an Indian Buddhist text. So it's interesting that I don't know if anybody really objected to this initially. But what, it, what, what this goes to show you, though, that this is not a Buddhist text, strictly speaking. The content is not morally or ethically in line with Buddhist values, because it's also talking about attacking cities. Um, you know, and it's also talking about you know, destroy, de destroying your enemy. 
So again, this is, this is very non-Buddhist, and it's very unusual for it to be saying this. But nevertheless, this was translated, and it was a very popular text. Now, I guess if you looked at it from like the perspective of Vajrayana, Mi Jiao, then you could possibly reinterpret what it's saying and say that it's merely symbolic, but there's no indication that this is symbolic language. But this kind of astrology is coming from a non-Buddhist tradition, because remember, um, Babylonian astrology, Indian astrology, and Greek astrology were not Buddhist, and the early Buddhist community objected and refuted astrology. But nevertheless, the Buddhists later on in India adopted astrology, practiced it, studied it. So basically, it's a very alien system that they had to incorporate. And then also, the deity associations, the Xiu Yao Jing also has different associations with deities. So Kirtika is associated with Agni. So Agni is the god of fire. Um, Jeshta is associated with Indra, and so on and so on. And so we can see here that the different constellations, Nakashetras, are associated with Indian deities. And this is also in the Shou Yao Jing. But the interesting thing about this is that this is coming from the Nakashetra Kalpa, the Atarva Veda. So these deity associations are coming from the Vedas. It's, it's not coming from a Buddhist text. Um, so, in other words, this is coming from what we would call a Hindu text, being incorporated into a major Buddhist text that was widely practiced in China. So, again, we, here we already see a mixing of non-Buddhist ideas with a Buddhist system. Because the Xiu Yao Jing is also said, it also says that it was taught by Manjushri, Wunshu Kusa, right? So, it, it's interesting, why would Manjushri Bodhisattva teach a text which talks about eating snakes, drinking alcohol, making weapons, attacking cities, and then there's these deity associations, which is actually um, basically a Vedic or a Hindu concept. It's very interesting and it's very peculiar. But the one thing I wonder is, how, did anybody object to this? Did anybody say, well, this doesn't sound very Buddhist to me at all? But by this time, Ni Jiao could basically teach well, I don't, I don't want to say non-Buddhist, but it, it could teach very unusual or atypical subjects. And there doesn't seem to have been too many objections to this. Now, the other interesting thing here is it says that, you know, that with the seven weekdays, it says here that if you, have, if you can't remember it, you can always ask, you know, a, a, a Persian or an Indian, because, you know, the, 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 the Hindus and the Manichaeans and the Zoroastrians will always keep a fast, Chang Yi Yi Er, Shi Jai. And then the Persians also, you know, um, se celebrate um, rituals on this day as well. So basically what this is saying is that the Chinese at the time did not have the concept of the seven weekdays. There was no concept of seven weekdays. So so if, if, if you want to practice, you know, different rituals and so on, on these days, you have to know what day of the week it is. Because each day is, is astrologically significant. But if you forget, what do you do? Well, you can always ask a Persian. You can ask a foreigner. Because in, in Chang'an, there was Persians, there was you know, Wu-ren, there was also Tianzhu-ren, and they all kept um, track of the days. Because on Sunday, they would fast or they would bathe. So it was very important to keep track of the days. So again, this is also reflecting a very international perspective. And then the next text that was translated that was especially significant is this Duli Yusuji. Um, and it introduces Hellenistic astrology into China. Um, it, is, it, it, it basically introduces what can be clearly identified as Greek. And so the Xin Tang Shu, which was compiled in 1060, lists this work with the following remark. So it says in the Zhenyuan period, which is around you know, 800, Common Era. It was transmitted from Western India by Uli Adept Yi Mi Qian and translated by Chu Gong. And then the um, Song Dynasty, Chong Wen, Song Wu, says it's Shi Chu Gong. So it's suggesting the translator was a monk. It's not exactly clear if he was a monk or not. It's just that if you have this Shi here, it suggests it's a monk. Um, but this text isn't extant anymore. But as for its name, the Japanese scholar Yamamichio 
Um, he, he suggests that it's actually uh, Ptolemy. So Ptolemy was a very famous Greek astrologer of the second century who lived in Alexandria in Egypt. Um, and then so in languages like Syrian, the vowels are not represented when you're writing something. So it would be rendered something like P-T-L-M-Y-D-S if you were you know, writing it with only consonants. And so the P could easily be dropped. So when we, when we have like uh, this Tuli Yusa, it could be T-L-Y-V-S. So it actually might be spelling out Ptolemy. Because th otherwise it's very unclear what this is um, phonetically representing. And the other thing we know about this text that it's Greek um, is because it has this idea of astrological aspect. Um, now, just briefly, astrological aspect, if, if you have a horoscope chart here, and you see that there's different angles. So, around the circle, the planets are in different places. And so, relative to one another, they'll have different angles, right? And so you can see here, like, you know, you have, like, some are square to one another, some are, you know, look like triangular to one another. And this was an idea that was developed by Greek astrologers in Alexandria, in Egypt, around the second century BC. And um, if we look at the fragments in the Duli Yusuf uh, now there was, it, it, there are actual citations of this preserved in a Sukuyo, uh, Shiyao, um, horoscope from Japan around 1152. Um, it says here that Saturn is in Jupiter's place, Jupiter is in the Moon's place. Um, this, uh, you can see here on the left here, the Sanhe, that refers to Trine. And Trine is, the, is, is one of the angles that the planets will make to one another on the horoscope chart. Um, and so we know that this was Greek. And this text was popular um, with both the uh, Buddhists as well as non-Buddhists eventually. Uh, now this is um, by Dumu. Unfortunately it's cut off here. But if you look here it says um, this Bing Le Gong Yi Yue Ba Sha Gong. Now what does that mean when it's talking about this Ba Sha Gong? This, this, this is actually Dumu's um, last writing. And it's actually full of Western astrology. It's, it's full of Greek astrology. It's just you have to understand um, the concept of what he's talking about here. So I'll just kind of focus on this Ba Sha Gong. Um, a lot of Chinese scholars um, initially didn't know what that meant either. But if you look at this table here, you can easily understand what he's talking about. Um, if you look on the, the eighth from you know the top here, it says death, Qi Bing. Basically what this is, is that on the horoscope chart, um, it, there's 12 places. And each of those places has some sort of symbolic significance. And these are the individual um, significances for each of the places on the chart. And so when Dumu, when Dumu, what, what Dumu was talking about is this. Um, so the num number one is life, right? So number one, he's talking about Chitra and Svati. So these are the Arshiba Show, the two of them. That's, that was the ascending point when he was born. So that was what was coming on the eastern horizon, right? So again, on the left here, we have the eastern horizon. The stars are rising in the east. And he's talking about um, this constellation, which is the 12 zodiacs, it's Libra, and then the two Arshibashyo, the Nakashetra associated with that, is Chitra and Svati, right? And then, when you look at the eighth place, there's Kritika, Taurus, and Rohini. And so, this concept of the 12 places is also um, mentioned in this other text in the Taisho. Now, if you look at the bottom bottom left there, it says Mingwei. And then the next one says Saiwu, right? And Xiongdi, Tianzhai, 
right? Again, this is talking about the 12 places and how each of them have their own significance, right? Now, if you go, if you, if you go around, you, you can see the different um, places. And so basically, Dumu is talking about this table. What he's mentioning is actually, like the actual meaning or content is identical to what is in this Buddhist text. Um, this text was translated or compiled around 800 AD, 800 CE. Yamamichio uh, has actually determined the uh, start of the calendar because this text is basically a um, almanac and it talks about on each day or each month where the planets are. So it's, an, it's basically a way, it's a calendar for understanding where the planets will be at any given time. And he's calculated that it starts around 800 CE. So this text was probably um, translated around that time. So, and then you have to make use of a table like this. So my point is, is that this is a Buddhist text, so the Buddhists were studying this as well. Dumu also made use of this same form of astrology. And if we recall, Dumu was also against Buddhism. He was like um, Han Yu, Han Yu, right? He didn't, he didn't like Buddhism either. But Han Yu also was interested in astrology. And he was interested in Western or Occidental astrology because his writings also reveal that as well. So it's interesting because this kind of astrology was introduced into China by Buddhists. And people who hated Buddhism still made use of this astrology. So it's, it's just very paradoxical. And it's also very funny. Um, and then later on, we have these different texts which are attributed to Yishi. Um, I mentioned them earlier, and these ones are all in the Taisho as well. And um, none of these texts are actually Yishins. And in a paper I'm writing, I actually demonstrate the details why. But I'll just show you a few examples of what it's talking about. So this Shouya um, Yigui, um, first it provides the mudra, so like how to configure your hands, right? And then it provides the mantra, Om Makasha Garbaya, Om Mali Kamali, Mali Saha, in um, transliterated Chinese. And then it also says here, if someone seeks merit and wisdom, they should take refuge in the Bodhisattva. And this last part here, you can see here, it says, So it's saying that the Bodhisattva is the stars. The Bodhisattva is, is the sun, moon, and stars. Um, and so this is a form of star worship. And it also is part of Mijo because you have the mantra and you also have the hand gesture. And so these texts, um, two, two or three of these texts include this sort of um, practice with um, the different mudras and uh, mantras. And then the other text, which is attributed to him, is this Chia Shin Chan Bie Xin Ba. And this is actually very Taoist, because um, if you look at the Chinese here that I've highlighted here, it says Zhi Qian Yi Ban Guan Qing Jiao, right? So it's saying that you should make an offering of paper money and alcohol. The point, basically, if, if, if this, uh, on, on this day here, so Qing uh, Qiao, Qing Qiao is so one of the Arshu Ba Shou, uh, Maga in Sanskrit, and then this um, spirit, this this Wang uh, Song uh, Shi, will be active, and then he's going to cause this disease. And so, if you find somebody who is afflicted or suffering from this spirit, you can make an offering of paper money and alcohol. Now, it's interesting that this is a Buddhist text as well, and they, it was attributed to Ishin, but Ishin didn't write this, and in Japan. Um, there's a scholar, uh, Osabe Kazuo. He initially looked at this and he said he didn't write this. And um, he, did, he, just, he just said as a, as a scholar of Shingon, he didn't believe that Ishin could write something like this. And I've looked at this text in a bit, uh, in a bit of detail. And for example, you have like um, Sogdian loanwords, Sogdia, so Lahuren, 
their language. And so, but Yixing was Chinese, and he's probably not going to put um, a Songtian word in his text. The other thing is that this, this sort of um, language, if you just look at the Chinese as well, um, it's not proper classical Chinese. Um, it, 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 it's not like in the Da Er Jing, because um, Yixing translated the Da Er Jing, which is very formal classical one yin one, right? But th this is different. And the rest of the text is also just um, very peculiar. And it, it, but also these illustrations, like this sort of illustration is in the text on the left. And that's exclusively Taoist. Now the other text um, in the Taisho I'd like to look at is this one, which is the Beidou Qixi in the Um And this is very clearly Taoist. So this is a worship of the um, Big Dipper, right? The Beidou Qixi. And if you look at the Chinese here, if you just look at that last part there, it says Shu Zhi Bei Dou Qi Xing Huan Ren Sheng Li. Now, Fu Tuo Shuo, wait a minute. No, he didn't. The Buddha did not teach this, but this text is saying that the Buddha said this: that your life is controlled by the seven stars. Your longevity, your lifespan is controlled by the stars. And so, um, the text also will provide um, the star which you're associated with. So if you know what day you were born, you'll know which of the stars um, you're supposed to make offerings to. Um, so if, if you have, uh, if, if you are under, you know, the, the one on the left there, the Po Jun Shi, you take that symbol, that talisman, and you write it down, and on certain days you make offerings to that star. And again, this is a Taoist idea. That was mixed with Buddhist ideas. Um, and the reason that this was possible, I think, was because, again, astrology was becoming very popular in the late Tang Dynasty. So from around the year 800, astrology was popular with Buddhists, Taoists, Confucians, you know, we have figures like Wu and Han Yu who were interested in astrology. And I think as a result of this, whoever wrote these texts could be successful in spreading them and having people read them and practice them because there was this very strong interest in the stars. And this idea that your life is determined by the stars. And so if your life is determined by the stars, then maybe you can, um, you know, generate these positive influences or get rid of the negative influences and, you know, this idea of yin ming, so extend your lifespan. And so this is just one prime example of this. And so this also affected the art record. Um, and this is one of the um, uh, famous paintings from Dunhuang. And so it's Techa Prabha, Prabha Buddha and the Five Planets. And so we have um, you know, uh, Techa Prabha Buddha right in the middle. And then we have the five planets uh, surrounding him. Um, it's a very beautiful painting, I think, just to begin with. But uh, if we look at uh, up close here. So the illustrations here are also largely identical to what is found in the Fan Tian Po Luo Zhou Yao, um, which is another one of the texts that's attributed to Yi Xing. And so this is Mars. This is uh, Wu Xing, Mars. Um, and it's portrayed as uh, Wai Dao, Wai Dao, so a heterodox or some sort of you know, non-Buddhist deity. Um, with the different weapons and the bowl. And then uh, on the left, you can see that there's a, a donkey, donkey head. Um, on, in the Chinese illustrations, often you have the planets associated with animals. And so if we look at Mercury here, it's a monkey, it's a monkey hat. I mean, it, it looks kind of funny, but that's Mercury. Um, and the interesting thing is that some of the um, iconography here, like the idea of holding a pen and paper, or um, if we go back here, at the bottom there, the lady playing the pipa is, uh, that's Venus, Jinxing, Jinxing. Now you also find that in, um, I've, I've seen uh, examples where it's very similar in Islamic astrology. So in Islamic astrology as well, Venus is portrayed playing an instrument of some sort. Um, but the animal hat is, um, I believe, originally from China. 
the animals associated with different planets. So again, it influenced the art record, it influenced poetry, and it influenced um, Buddhism as well, and popular religion. So astrology was, it was very, very popular in the late Tang Dynasty. And then there's another painting here, which is um, apparently, it's, it's attributed to uh, Zhang Sangyao, who died around 450, or otherwise Nanming San, a contemporary of Yixing. And so on the right here, we see the um, Iburen, the, it's, a, it's a Brahmin riding a bull, and then we also have, uh, I think that's Venus on the left riding the Phoenix. And if we go back, so if, if you look at the bottom left there, we also have the bull, and we have, um, that is Saturn on the bottom left there. So interestingly too about this is that it's portraying an Indian as an Indian. So he actually looks Indian. So whoever painted this knew what an Indian is supposed to look like, because he doesn't look Chinese. And then if we go back um, to this, we see that, again, he looks like a real Indian, and he's riding a bull. Um, but the one problem with the attribution here is, I think this is too early. I don't think this could have been painted in the 6th century, and I don't think it could have been painted in the 8th century either. I'm not an art historian, but the first reference to this kind of um, iconography, um, these sort of ideas, uh, is I guess from the 9th century. Because if this was really from the um, 6th century, then uh, the introduction of Indian astrology into China happened much earlier, but there's no evidence that this, that this is the case. Now, the texts I was just talking about, like the Xiuya Yi Gui, which are attributed to Yixing, are also from the 9th century, and they were attributed to Yixing. So my opinion is that this painting was probably painted in maybe the 9th or 10th century, and then attributed to um, a famous painter, or the other attribution is to um, Yang Lingzan, who was a um, contemporary of Yixing, and this uh, Yang Lingzan also worked with Yixing, because he was um, also very good at astronomy. So he worked together with Yixing. And if you look at the Zhou Tang Shu, it talks about how Yang Lingzan and Yixing worked together on different projects, like astronomical projects. So basically, I think what was happening in the ninth century or so was you had a lot of people who were writing texts, producing art, and then attributing it to these past famous figures um, in, in the years back. Uh, and then this sort of influence also lasted into the uh, Song Dynasty. Uh, again, if you um, look at the, if you look at some of the um, uh, the, the text catalogs from the Song uh, Song Shi, it talks about this Du Li Yu Si Jing. So we have like the Du Li Yu Si Ge and the Jing Jue. And so what this means is that this uh, text, which is Greek astrology, Hellenistic astrology was also being practiced in the Song Dynasty because we have all these texts which were um, preserved and copied in the Song Dynasty. Uh, this text though doesn't seem to last until the Yuan Chao. So like in the, the Yuan Dynasty, um, it was uh, either discontinued, destroyed, um, they lost interest in it, but um, it wasn't preserved. And this text also wasn't preserved in um, Japan either. We know that people in the Heian period and the Kamakura period were practicing it as well, but the original text has been lost, and there's just fragments of it. Um, and uh, we also have this one guy, his, oh, I can't see it, but uh, Chu Yan. And uh, again, the place I've highlighted here um, says that he was really good at this Yu Si Jing. Um, and then the other thing is that he helped uh, produce this Chong Tian Li in the early Song Dynasty. So again, you have a very eminent um, member of the court who was also practicing Western astrology. Um, by this time, I'm not really sure if there was much of a perception that this was foreign. I think it had already become very natural. It had been translated into Chinese. 
Um, and the memory of it having been imported from abroad might have been largely forgotten at that point. And I think maybe we can just uh, open the questions now. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you. Okay, so now open for questions. If you have any questions, you can ask questions. You can speak English. Oh, yes, speak English. Can you use ask questions? Oh, okay. You can ask Chinese questions. If you have any questions, This cannot be written by him for one simple reason. is because in this text, it um, cites the Yu Se Jing. It's in the Yu Se Jing. And that was translated around the year 800. And Yi Xing, he died in 727. So he could not have written this. Um, that's just one example. And the other thing is that that text has a set of mantras um, for the different planets. Mm -hmm. So there's a mantra for the sun, there's a mantra for the moon, and so on. And the earliest example of that, of those mantras, is mm -hmm. from around 800, the year 800. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's no evidence that there that the, that, that this sort of material was available to Yixing. Mm -hmm. um, and then this text and these other texts as well are citing um, mantras or texts that had been translated after Yixing had died. Mm -hmm. So basically there's anachronisms mm -hmm. um, in the texts that would make it impossible for him to have edited them either. Mm -hmm. Now it's easy to say Yixing wrote this because he had training in Taoism when he was young. Mm -hmm. And there's a scholar, um, Moliere, who has, and even, um, uh, what's his name, Xiao Dong Fu? Yeah, uh, Christine Moliere. Right. So they, they looked at these texts and they said, oh, Yixing was practicing Taoism. But they didn't look at the text close enough because like Osabe Kazuo has done, he looked at the text and said he could not have written this. Yeah. Right. So Christine Mollier looked at this and so actually in her recent book, she made a catastrophic error when she's saying that this text in particular was his great um, treatise on astrology. Mm -hmm. um, now the other thing is that she also cites Osabe Kazuo's work, his Japanese book, which is a biography of uh, Ishin. Mm -hmm. And Kazuo Osabe in his book says, no, he didn't write this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I don't know why she made that error. Mm -hmm. and so that was a big error on her part. Yeah, I see. Yeah, it's, it's possible, but uh, like, is that possible there's a tradition that they collect all different kinds of texts and put them together and trade it to Ishin? So that's yeah. to be oh, along the ninth century. It was in the ninth century. It's also because if you look at uh, the manuscript, there's something at the top of it that says that the attribution to Yixing happened something like 150 years uh -huh. after Yixing had died. Uh -huh. And so that would place it sometime in the ninth century. Mm -hmm. uh, and so basically what it was is that there was this practice of star worship and astrology 
and whoever wrote these texts basically brought together different sources into a like shinpa, a sadhana, a practice for people to do. And um, it was it's interesting too because the Japanese monks who went to late Tang Dynasty China brought these texts back with them to Japan. And that tells me one thing. It means that the Japanese had spoke to people in China, probably monks, and the monks had said, well, this is a good practice. You should take it back with you. So it was available to them. Because if, if I think if the Tang Dynasty monks at the time thought that this was a bad practice, they probably would have told the Japanese monks, you know, don't take this back with you, don't practice this. So it seems that it was also popular among monastics. Um, the Du Li Yu Jing that was translated around 800 was also brought to Japan um, by a monk named Shu Ei. And so that was around, I think it was around 856. In the 850s, he brought it back with him. And in his, uh, the the Mulu, the Mokuro um, Mokuro, he also says that this is a like a worldly text, Shi Jie right? It's not a Buddhist text, but he says it's very, it's useful, it's valuable, it's necessary. Uh, and so what that indicates to me is that when he was in China, uh, the monks there also said this is a good text. And we're making use of this, so you, you should bring it back with you as well. Mm -hmm. And so that, that seems to have been where the text was brought to Japan, around 856 or so. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, they, they were basically um, compilations of different texts. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 It's pretty obvious because it's different sources and different texts. Right. There's no logic library that the code Right. It's totally different transition. And they're also very short texts as yeah. well. It's, it's not like, you know, that regime, there's very complex rituals. This one is like basically, even if you could only read part of it, it it's very simple anyways, and it tells you like, you know, how to do the mudra mm -hmm. with your hand, mm -hmm. the mantra, easy, mm -hmm. and then also some of the texts they provide, the dates, like, mm -hmm. on this day do this, on this day do that. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, a, it's a very relatively easy system. And the other thing is too, is you think like maybe just like one or two pages, and so something like this might have actually been sold. Mm -hmm. It might have actually been something that people sold at the marketplace or monks sold to lay people. Uh, it was it, it popular Buddhism. And that's what um, Osabe Kazuo also says is that Yixing did not write these texts, but it's useful for the simple fact that um, it, it shows us what 9th century popular Buddhism in China looked like. And it also shows us how the um, Chinese monks at the time, or Buddhists, thought of Yixing's time. So they maybe imagined that in Yixing's time, because Yixing was an astronomer, that he was doing all of this, you know, star worship and astral magic and so on. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Chinese astrology um, is represented by fun, fun ye, right? You know what that is, right? That was not incorporated into Buddhist astrology. It seems very um, minimal. There's, like, this text here mentions it very briefly. It says that you know this constellation is associated with this, but that's just telling you where it is in the sky. Uh, the other thing is that native Chinese astrology is very different from um, Indian or Greek astrology. For example, in uh, Greek and Indian astrology, the planet Saturn is negative, it's bad, it's unwanted, right? Tushing. But then in Chinese astrology, it's considered good, right? So uh, as a result of that, they were very incompatible. And 
the other thing too is that Chinese astrology in that time period, I don't think it was very relevant to individuals. Because again, if you look at Fan Ye, it's the fate of the nation. It's talking about the country. It's talking about the army. Um, it's not talking about people. Whereas this kind of astrology is talking about, as an individual, what's good for you, you know, how to, you know, get these positive influences, how to get rid of the negative influences. Um, so yeah, the, the traditions were very separate. And the other thing we have to keep in mind too is that the scientific astronomy, because in um, China, the court had, you know, um, very advanced knowledge of astronomy, so they could predict eclipses and so on. Mm -hmm. But this was advanced knowledge and it was secret. Yeah. It was it was considered government yeah. secret information. Because if, if you were if you were the emperor, you were the one who had to make the calendar. And you had to predict eclipses. Because if you did predict an eclipse, people would think that you're a bad leader <laughs> and incompetent. Right? And the other thing is that if somebody else decided to make their own calendar, then they could claim to be emperor. That was the first step to basically taking over the country was to issue your own calendar because that's the right of the emperor. So the Buddhists didn't really seem to have access to this knowledge either. Um, Yixing is the one exception, but he was a court astronomer. He worked basically directly for the um, the emperor himself. Um, but most Buddhists had no access to that knowledge and actually it didn't seem like they had any interest in that either. So Buddhist astrology in China was influential, but it wasn't very advanced. Um, like you, you didn't have to predict eclipses and so on, and even like the level of um, um, astrology is is still compared to Greek, like full Greek astrology is also very basic as well. You basically just have to know what day somebody was born, and then you can just use the manual and then build up a horoscope for them. It doesn't get as complex as it does in traditional Greek astrology. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. But how about the, the concept of the, you know, our faith is related to a certain star or certain constellation? Because I, I think it's, even in Buddhism, it's not very easy to find like in the medieval, I mean, the sixth dynasty China, but after like eighth and or eighth or ninth century, the idea of the you know, Personal faith relate to a certain constellation or star, like like most people, a certain right, star most people right, become very crucial after the song is become very mainstream of the idea. Right. How do you think is that a relation with uh, the Indian astrology or? There or might be a basic Chinese idea. I think that's more of a basic Chinese idea. Although the idea of individual fate connected with the stars and so on, that might have been. The, the idea for that might have been influenced by um, Western astrology. The, yeah, <laughs> Western astrology as well. Mm -hmm. um, I, it, it, the other thing is, is that we have to make a distinction between the later developments, because after the Song Dynasty, um, this sort of astrology wasn't really relevant or even really well known mm -hmm. amongst Buddhists in China, mm -hmm. which is why I basically ended at the Song Dynasty, because mm -hmm. after then it doesn't seem that it was practiced very much. Mm -hmm. And then you have this native form of yeah. Chinese astrology, which yeah. becomes very mainstream, and maybe monks yeah. would practice that, but um, the knowledge of this was, I guess, really only preserved in Japan, mm -hmm. but the, the tradition is called the Sukuyodo, which is mm -hmm. Dao, yeah. Dao, mm -hmm. um, which actually preserved this kind of astrology until today, yeah. and it's still, it's actually still a living tradition in Japan, mm -hmm. and the Shouyao Dao, the, the main text, the Shouyao Jing, was printed in the Meiji period. Mm -hmm. And then after World War II, the, I guess the representatives of the tradition, who I think were connected mostly with Shingon, Zhen Yanfeng mm -hmm. in um, Japan, mm -hmm. also presented themselves to the public, made some um, books, published them, mm -hmm. and uh, this was made available to the public. And so now, actually in Japan, if you go to the bookstore, you can find books on this kind of astrology, next to the Western astrology. Mm -hmm. So it, it survived. Mm -hmm. The Shouyao Dao was really popular in the Heian, so uh, Ping An and the Kamakura period. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then after that period, it, 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 it declined, but it never disappeared. Mm -hmm. And there was actually the Shouyao Dao, the Shouyao Jing, those sort of ideas influenced the Japanese literature as well, like the Tale of Genji, Genji Monogatari. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Those are the rituals. Right. 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 Right
In Xingdong. In Xingdong. In Xingdong. It's really cool. But in China, it's not not lasting like this. Do you find any ritual in 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 Tang Dynasty or? Well, the only the only rituals that I that I'm really aware of are in these texts here. Mm -hmm. But then that that what that indicates is that there were probably far more advanced rituals. It's just that they haven't been preserved. Mm -hmm. You don't find them in the Taisho. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the Shingon manuals from the Heian period, they do have very complex rituals. And some of the ideas are coming from these texts. Mm -hmm. um, so the Japanese seem to have taken more of an interest in, in this. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure. In the, in the ninth century, uh, there might have actually been um, much more complex rituals in China as well. It's just I haven't seen any record of that mm -hmm. as yet. There was also like worship of um, the te Tetra Prabha Buddha, mm -hmm. who, is, who is in... Uh, so this yeah, is Tetra, tetra yeah, tetra, tetra Prabha Buddha, mm -hmm. and so there was like if you in the art, so there's paintings of him, and then there's also some stone mm -hmm. uh, sculptures of him as well, yeah, yeah. right? So he's he, he's a kind of cosmic Buddha, mm -hmm. and uh, in in this place here, he's representing the sun because he's mm -hmm. he's at the center, yeah. and so the light is emanating from him. I don't know this painting also. There might have actually been a, another part to it. But it seems lost because there's also Rahu and Ketu, mm -hmm. so the two the hidden planets in Indian astronomy and astrology, mm -hmm. um, and then they're often portrayed in the art as well, mm -hmm. but not in this painting. Mm -hmm. no. Do you think that the uh, Chang Tantra Buddhist monk practices their ritual by weekday? Actually, yes, because in the Shou Yao Jing, it does talk about on which day of the week it, it, um, things are supposed to happen. Like each day is has some sort of astrological significance, and Kukai also um, seems to have taken interest in this as well. Kong Pai, so he might have learned this from Huihu. It seems to me. So, but it's also because Amoga Vajra Hukong, he probably stressed this. He thought this was important. That's why he translated this. Because you have to do the ritual on certain days of the week. So yes, I do think, at least by Moka Vajra's time, there was an interest in keeping track of the weekdays. The only problem is, like I pointed out here, is that China did not have the idea of weekdays yet. But the Persians, the Indians did. Because there is a Heiyuan, Baiyuan, according to the Indian calendar, uh, fifteen days. Yeah, fifteen days. Uh, days. Right. So, uh, yeah, that, but that, if you if you but that's also another um, aspect to the tradition because you 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 have to keep track of the bayu and the heyu, um, but that's different from the weekdays, of course, as yes. well. But the thing is, though, is like you know when when we go back to uh, where are we here? This, right? So we have a table, and so y you just have to know. Because each, each month has 30 days, right? And then you just have to know which day on the lunar calendar you want, right? So, so, right? So it's going to be um, Purva Vajrapada, right? And then, but then keeping track of what day of the week it is is another complex matter. And the Xiu um, Yao Jing actually provides a very complex mathematical formula for calculating what day of the week it is. But it's very complex, and um, I can't really understand what it's saying. Yamamichio explains it, but I don't really understand what it's saying. But again, the text also says, if you don't know, just go ask a foreigner. Because the Indian, the Persian in Chang'an would have known. Because they had this custom of, of maintaining a fast and so on, on Sundays. So. Are you going to write, write any article about this? Yes, exactly. Well, 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 the article that I'm, I'm getting published now is about the Vidya and astrology. Mm -hmm. Because I'm, I'm looking at, there's this paradox, there's this problem, that the Sutra, the Vinaya all say that astrology is bad, don't do it. But then in China, you find all these monks doing astrology. And so the paper that I'm publishing is going to look at that. And then my PhD dissertation is about astrology in China or Buddhist astrology in the Tang Dynasty especially. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. And then I think in the future too I want to also investigate um, 
the um, Sukuyodo, the Shoyadao tradition in Japan, because it seems to preserve a lot of material from China that you don't find in the Taisho Canon. Um, and it's just a matter of determining what was created by the Japanese and where they got these ideas from. Um, so again, it, it, it's, a, it's a very long process. And again, it's not, it's not very well investigated. Like even in Japan, there's a few people who have studied um, the Sukuyodo Shoyadao, but um, it's not very, it's not, not a very popular subject. It's sort of like also the Onyodo, the Yiyang Dao Onyodo, which again preserved all of this Chinese material, but then also created their own material. And so this is actually a new field even in Japan of, of looking at the Sukuyodo and Onyodo traditions. And so it has a lot of uh, uh, new areas to explore. Right, so why, why did Manjushri <laughs> teach the sutra? Actually, the, the, the answer to that is Amogavadra, he compiled the text, mm -hmm. and it's not actually a sutra, but then he just said Manjushri taught it, mm -hmm. and then it's a Buddhist text. Even though the actual content's not Buddhist at all. Not at all Buddhist. But he wanted to make it legitimate, make it a proper text, a respectable text. So he said Banjushri Talit. That's that seems to be the answer to that question. It, yeah, it's very peculiar. Because the text talks about drinking alcohol. Because it says on certain days of the month, or yeah, um, you can drink alcohol, make alcohol, make weapons, fight people, go to war. So it's very not it's, it's very un Buddhist. <laughs> which is what I'm addressing in the paper that I'll have published hopefully this year. So yeah, so again, this yeah. is the, the 12, the 12 yeah, places. Sure. Yeah. Um, well, the, the way that it's understood here is coming from the Hellenic tradition. Mm -hmm. This is like Hellenistic astrology, Greek astrology. And um, we have a chart like this, uh, which again, this is coming straight from a Buddhist text that's in the Taisho. Although, again, I don't really think this is, strictly speaking, um, a Buddhist text. It's just that it's found in the Buddhist canon. But this text also has mantras for um, different planets, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as well as the almanac, which says where the planets will be on each month. Right? Mm -hmm. But then it provides this table because if you're an astrologer, you can look to it and quickly determine the facts you need. So if you understand this chart, then you can do somebody's horoscope very quickly. Mm -hmm. And then you basically produce something like this. So this is Bumu's chart, mm -hmm. as he describes in his uh, text. Right. So he was so he, he was uh, you know born under Chitra, and then he's talking about how in the eighth house there uh, there's uh, Mars and Saturn, mm -hmm. and so it's very bad fortune for him. Mm -hmm. Right. But is is this about uh, just you know one month uh, during a year or just during somebody's life? Oh, this is this is basically one day, one day. Be because like if you look on the eastern horizon here, and it's also basically. What is rising on the horizon in the morning? 
Like what part of the what part of the stars? Which stars are rising on the eastern horizon on that day? And so, if you know that, then you can quickly consult this table and get all the facts you need. It, but the, what what developed like what 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 a, what a Chinese astrology now would use was greatly developed afterwards, like from the Song and Ming dynasty. You have really complex um, forms of astrology, which was also you know the the Taoists developed their own forms of astrology as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's that's a later development. But as I know that the so wind is not as early as the thirteen oh eight. It's not so early. No, 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 that's not the year. That's not the year. Okay, so of course. That's the Taisho. That's the Taisho. Taisho. Uh, well, but this idea, this is, this, you know, it's almost similar to, you know, but we just use it so we don't shoot. Yeah. Right. But, but this table here is from a text from around 800, yeah. the year 800. Yeah, so it's so early. It's really early. Early. Really early, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so they, they, they liked using these tables because it's easy to understand the data. Mm -hmm. um, and so you, you also you find these sort of tables in um, in other texts as well, and then also in Dunhuang, um, you also have some of the charts like this as well. Um, so astrology was also very popular, it seems, around Dunhuang. Mm -hmm. And there's there's also uh, what year is that? Sometime in the 10th century, there is a, a horoscope actually from Dunhuang, and the horoscope was done by Kang um, Ren, so a Sogdian, Hu Ren, right? So he, he was Sogdian, he wrote it in Chinese. And then he includes, you know, Indian ideas, Chinese ideas, and then, you know, these sort of ideas from the Buddhist texts as well. So what that also goes to show you, though, is that in the early Song and even the late Tang Dynasty was that even in places like Dunhuang, astrology like this was very popular. So if it, if it was popular at Dunhuang, then probably it was very popular in you know Chang'an, and then in the Song Dynasty, you know around Hangzhou and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. you know. mm -hmm. So did the native um, Chinese astrology develop in other like, like the West or India? Like did it go the other way? Well, that's a good question. Did Chinese <laughs> astrology ever go West? I've never seen any indication of that. So far. I've never seen any indication that that actually happened because you have to explain how that knowledge was translated and transmitted. I'm not saying that's impossible, um, but like for example, alchemy, Chinese alchemy, there's some people who suspect that Chinese alchemy um, was possibly transmitted to India at some point. Mm -hmm. It's just that that's been like knowledge of that has been lost in history because I guess some people see parallels between. Indian alchemy and Chinese alchemy. And there were Indians who lived like down in Southeast Asia. And then some of them lived in what's now like Guangzhou. Yeah. There were Brahmins. Even like Fa Xian in the fifth century, when he was taking a boat back to China, mm -hmm. on his boat he said Wolomun, so there were Brahmins, or people he considered to be Indian mm -hmm. was on a boat with him when he was going to southern China. Yeah. So yeah, it is possible that um, this Chinese astrology to some degree went west. It, I think the furthest west I've ever seen it is Dunhuang. But the thing is, if it got to Dunhuang, then maybe it was also transmitted um, further west. Yeah, along the Silk Road. Right along the Silk Road. The only thing is, is that by the time you get to around the year 800 or so on, and then in the 9th century, um, the Taran base in Xinjiang is, is, is losing its influence. The trade routes have been disrupted, and later Islam takes over it. So these cultures also lost their... Um, old languages like um, Cotonese and so on, these were lost. And then, if anything, they would have been studying Islamic astrology. Um, I'd have to look into that though. Um, Does anyone know if this is still practiced in Taiwan? Because <laughs> um, I went to S Light and I looked for Xiao Yao, Xiao Yao Jing, Xiao Yao Jing, yeah, 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 nothing. nothing. <laughs> that's not in mainstream. No. No. Mm -hmm. 
，用用。对，那个哪一天剪头发，哪一天剪头发，现在台湾流行这个。然后，然后那个就跟那个西藏，西藏叫也是用那个，也是树药，就是里面那个剪头，剪头发的。哦 ，OK。不是变成藏历而已。Yeah, that's actually a very interesting point too. Is that the Tibetans also received Indian astrology as well? Um, I haven't investigated it to great extent, um, but. Even the Tibetan calendar is greatly influenced by Indian uh, astrology. And then later on, especially the Kala Chakra um, calendar and astrology. The Kala Chakra. So it, it also, I mean, the Tibetan calendar and system of astrology, it took Indian elements as well as native Tibetan elements, as well as some Chinese elements. And so it's a hybrid. Um, maybe in the future, that's something I could look at is um, do comparisons of how Indian astrology was received in Tibet as well as in China. So, yeah. I mean, again, this is a subject that hasn't been actually studied in any great depth. Um, it, like, basically, in the last 50 years, there's been like two or three Japanese scholars who have looked at um, the materials, especially as it's available in Japan. Um, but again, it's a very open field. There's lots to, lots to study and learn. Yeah,那是什么？就是大，就是你刚说的那样。就是还有，不能西藏那个占卜，那就是占卜。啊，他们也说是从，那就是那个，就是这样。哦，所以可能跟那个，对，可能有关系。然后现在一般台湾佛教
Like, if you just think about that, that's just really amazing <laughs> how far that went. Actually, the other thing I'll note too is actually, even today, um, recently uh, uh, a big shuni was telling me that in Sri Lanka, Mm -hmm. um, the monks and nuns there still practice astrology and they take it very seriously. Um, Indian astrology is called Jyotish. Jyotish. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, although Jyotish has also kind of developed its own unique forms because in the last thousand years it's been influenced by Islamic astronomy and astrology. And then what's practiced as Jyotish today is very different from what was practiced with Mogavadra and so on. I mean, you can see the similarities, but it developed and it evolved. But it's interesting that in Sri Lanka, um, astrology is apparently very popular with the monks and nuns. And this bhikkhuni, she told me that when she ordained in Sri Lanka, that the nuns actually did her horoscope. Because they want to know if she has a good horoscope. And if she had a bad horoscope, they would probably find some reason to say, no, 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 you can't, you can't, <laughs> can't become a bhikkhuni today. So they, they still take it very seriously there. Yeah. But that never translated to Chinese, right? Uh, well, it would. Well, um, or is that similar? I, I, I don't know what they practice in Sri Lanka, but it's probably a form of sort of medieval Indian Jyotish astrology. Jyotish, right? Jyotish. Right, Jyotish astrology. Mm -hmm. Again, what, what what's considered Jyotish astrology now is probably very different from what was practiced in Tang China mm -hmm. amongst like a and so on. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that Jyotish is very complex and. Um, very, uh, it's a very complicated system, mm -hmm. but whereas a Mogavadra system is very simple because you just have to know what day of the month it is, and then you can compile um, a horoscope or a, an individual's chart very easily. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, the other thing is that the Shou Yao Jing is very good because it tells you um, what days of the month are good for doing the rituals. Mm -hmm. So, it, as an individual, you can you can make your own um, chart up, and you can you know look at your own individual horoscope and so on. But uh, for the Mijao Sanyao, the, the you know, uh, Mantrayana temples, communities, it, it would have been very useful for them to coordinate yeah. their schedule, yeah. have, make a schedule for practice and so on. So that must be a very useful tool because you have to learn the practice of each other. Right. I should have followed very good on this chart because uh, you mentioned that this is about a day, but how could it be possible that you know, somebody is uh, for one day, you know, from the western horizon to eastern horizon, you know, from in one day, and somebody is in Bulag, you know, all his family, somebody is in Bulag, and somebody is in Bulag. How could it be possible? You know, some, sometimes. You know, but we just go through one day, and maybe you know, in, you know, during that day, oh, you know, we, I just have a good luck in, in that day. Oh, but this, this is the person's birth. So, so, um, so, like again, if we, if we look at this, uh -huh. so number one is the like just below the horizon here, right, eastern horizon, because uh -huh. it's rising in the east, the stars, right, mm -hmm. and so in so this is Dumu, according to what he's talking about, mm -hmm. right, because. We looked at this quote by Dumu, right? Mm -hmm. Right? And so he's saying like Iyue Pasha Kong Pushin right? So he's saying that Saturn is in the eighth place. Mm -hmm. So he's describing when he was born mm -hmm. on the eastern horizon was Chichar Libra Spati, right? And then in the eighth house, the house of death. Mm -hmm. Right? Because that actually the, the eighth house uh, eighth house, the eighth place will predict where you're going to how you're gonna die. Right? And so that's what he's talking about here. And so if you know the if you know the day when somebody was born, then you basically make use of this chart. Like whether it actually works or not, that's entirely subjective. Um, like astrology is, is not scientific. Well, I, I mean so this is also predicting somebody's whole life. This is uh, yeah. it's a birthday. Yeah, first first birthday birth. birth. And then, then you, 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 like so, you know, for example, if if like a, um, a good planet, like um, I guess uh, Venus, right, is in the first house, right, or the fourth house, or something like that, you can make a prediction based on that. 
Yeah, yeah, this is what I mean. This right. is what I ask. So this, uh, I just wondering if this lasts for somebody's whole life, not only, you know, yeah. uh, during some day or something. Yeah, you're, you're, okay. you're trying to predict what's going to happen in their whole life yeah. based yeah. on this That's system. Yeah. So this is the same idea. Yeah, same idea. So you're, you're making a prediction about the person at their birth. Yeah. yeah. Whether it works or not, I don't know. Because many people believe in astrology, many people don't believe in astrology. But the thing to note that actually astrology up until, well, okay, in Europe until at least the 18th or 19th century, most people thought astrology was perfectly reasonable, natural, and valid. And then with the Renaissance, people started opposing it. And then in East Asia and India, mm -hmm. most people today still seem to believe in it, except for maybe Japan, because Japan is very westernized. But here in Taiwan, I think many, many people believe in astrology. Like Swan Ming, very popular, right? Mm -hmm. Well, if you ask me, I don't believe this, because I think this is only talking about the astrology, only, uh, you know, this is only based on the star. Right. But uh, if you really want to know somebody's fortune, you have to combine Kinga and the Ji, not only from the star. Right. Yeah. Again, so, but again, <laughs> again <laughs> it, it, it's really, it was very popular and like, yeah. it's subjective. Like, I guess if, 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 if somebody believes in this, then um, it's, it's valid to them. And if they don't believe in it, then it has no utility, it has no value to them. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's interesting though, just when you look at it from a historian's point of view, how influential this was. This was very influential in China and Japan, but it also was very influential in Europe, mm -hmm. right? Like, like astrology in the in the Middle Ages and in the Renaissance, early Renaissance, was very popular. Like in the 16th century, you had um, you know hundreds of astrologers writing books trying to predict the future of of, of countries and, and the, the you know Europe uh, based on astrology mm -hmm. and. Um, there wasn't so much objection to it until the later part of the Renaissance, like around the 16th, 17th century, when astronomy became separated from astrology. And you had the early science develop, where it was based on reason, theory, hypothesis, and materialism. And then so the um, underlying basis for believing in astrology was completely destroyed. Right? But the, the unfortunate thing is that a lot of people, even in the West today, forget the influence that astrology had in Europe. Um, they're just, because uh, history, really, history doesn't really talk about how influential it was. Meanwhile, kings like consulted astrologers all the time. And it, it was, was the same also in China and India. Yeah. It's almost like where if you study this subject, you're basically rediscovering parts of history that have been largely forgotten or overlooked because it's not a very popular subject. Like when I tell people I'm researching the history of astrology, many people laugh. And they ask, do you believe in that? I said, I'm, what does it matter if I believe in it or not? I'm interested in this as a historian. So, and I think it's, I think it's a very cool system. I think it's, it's, it's like it creates all these different ideas. If you actually like look at you know, an astrology horoscope and stuff, you just, you know, it, it generates all these ideas that you, you, you might not have otherwise thought about in your life about different influences and so on. So, but the thing is that astrology, like the original idea was that it, it, that the planets directly influenced your life. There was a direct influence on your life from the stars. Mm -hmm. And that was the same in the East and it was the same in the West. Um, so, and um, in, in the Greek world, like Ptolemy, he had to try to explain a material um, force that allowed for this, because even in, in, in uh, you know in the in the Greek world and the Roman world, there were skeptics, there were rationalists who said this is impossible. I think like Cicero was skeptical of, of, of astrology, and so they had to justify. It. But whereas in India and China, I've never actually seen um, any great discussions trying to explain how astrology works. Like in these Buddhist texts, none of them talk about how astrology works. It just says. Um, this planet will have this influence, this constellation will have this influence, and you either believe it or you don't. There's no way to try to uh, justify it or validate it. So that's another difference between what developed in Greece and what developed in Asia. So. Yeah. Thank you very much.
Oh, and uh, so if you if you want to email me, that's my email, mm -hmm. and that's my blog. If you want to look at my blog, so on my blog I have information about all this sort of thing right now. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Jeffrey, that that blog, that is very good. If you go there, you can find many articles that you can find there. <laughs> also, if you want the slides, I can upload them to um, somewhere. Somewhere. Okay. Yeah, I can upload them. Maybe you can send it to everybody. Yeah. Okay. Yeah.